6. The Eyes of Tassila. Why did you bring me into this chamber to bandage my legs? demanded Valeria. Couldn't you have done it just as well in the throne room? She sat on a couch with her wounded leg extended upon it, and the Tecultli woman had just bound it with silk bandages. Valeria's red-stained sword lay on the couch beside her. She frowned as she spoke. The woman had done her task silently and efficiently, but Valeria liked neither the lingering caressing touch of her slim fingers, nor the expression in her eyes. They have taken the rest of the wounded into the other chambers, answered the woman in the soft speech of the Tecultli women, which somehow did not suggest either softness or gentleness in the speakers. A little while before, Valeria had seen this same woman stab a Zotalanka woman through the breast and stamp the eyeballs out of a wounded Zotalanka man. They will be carrying the corpses of the dead down into the catacombs, she added, lest the ghosts escape into the chambers and dwell there. Do you believe in ghosts? asked Valeria. I know the ghost of Tolkemec dwells in the catacombs, she answered with a shiver. Once I saw it, as I crouched in a crypt among the bones of a dead queen. It passed by in the form of an ancient man with flowing white beard and locks, and luminous eyes that blazed in the darkness. It was Tolkemec. I saw him living when I was a child and he was being tortured. Her voice sank to a fearful whisper. Olmec laughs, but I know Tolkemec's ghost dwells in the catacombs. They say it is rats which gnaw the flesh from the bones of the newly dead, but ghosts eat flesh. Who knows but that— She glanced up quickly as a shadow fell across the couch. Valeria looked up to see Olmec gazing down at her. The prince had cleansed his hands, torso and beard of the blood that had splashed them, but he had not donned his robe, and his great dark-skinned hairless body and limbs renewed the impression of strength bestial in its nature. His deep black eyes burned with a more elemental light, and there was the suggestion of a twitching in the fingers that tugged at his thick blue-black beard. He stared fixedly at the woman, and she rose and glided from the chamber. As she passed through the door, she cast a look over her shoulder at Valeria, a glance full of cynical derision and obscene mockery. She has done a clumsy job, criticized the prince coming to the divan and bending over the bandage. Let me see. With a quickness amazing in one of his bulk, he snatched her sword and threw it across the chamber. His next move was to catch her in his giant arms. Quick and unexpected as the move was, she almost matched it, for even as he grabbed her, her dirk was in her hand, and she stabbed murderously at his throat. More by luck than skill, he caught her wrist, and then began a savage wrestling match. She fought him with fists, feet, knees, teeth and nails, with all the strength of her magnificent body, and all the knowledge of hand-to-hand -hand fighting she had acquired in her years of roving and fighting on sea and land. It availed her nothing against his brute strength. She lost her dirk in the first moment of contact, and thereafter found herself powerless to inflict any appreciable pain on her giant attacker. The blaze in his weird black eyes did not alter and their expression filled her with fury, fanned by the sardonic smile that seemed carved upon his bearded lips. Those eyes and that smile contained all the cruel cynicism that seethes below the surface of a sophisticated and degenerate race, and for the first time in her life, Valeria experienced fear of a man. It was like struggling against some huge elemental force. His iron arms thwarted her efforts with an ease that sent panic racing through her limbs. He seemed impervious to any pain she could indict. Only once, when she sank her white teeth savagely into his wrist so that the blood started, did he react, and that was to buffet her brutally upon the side of the head with his open hand, so that stars flashed before her eyes and her head rolled on her shoulders. Her shirt had been torn open in the struggle, and with cynical cruelty he rasped his thick beard across her bare breasts, bringing the blood to suffuse the fair skin and fetching a cry of pain and outraged fury from her. Her convulsive resistance was useless. She was crushed down on a couch, disarmed and panting, her eyes blazing up at him like the eyes of a trapped tigress. A moment later he was hurrying from the chamber, carrying her in his arms. She made no resistance, but the smoldering of her eyes showed that she was unconquered in spirit at least. She had not cried out. She knew that Conan was not within call 
and it did not occur to her that any in Tecultli would oppose their prince. But she noticed that Olmec went stealthily, with his head on one side as if listening for sounds of pursuit, and he did not return to the throne chamber. He carried her through a door that stood opposite that through which he had entered, crossed another room, and began stealing down a hall. As she became convinced that he feared some opposition to the abduction, she threw back her head and screamed at the top of her lusty voice. She was rewarded by a slap that half stunned her, and Olmec quickened his pace to a shambling run. But her cry had been echoed, and twisting her head about, Valeria, through the tears and stars that partly blinded her, saw Tecotl limping after them. Olmec turned with a snarl, shifting the woman to an uncomfortable and certainly undignified position under one huge arm, where he held her writhing and kicking vainly, like a child. Olmec, protested Tecotl, you cannot be such a dog as to do this thing. She is Conan's woman. She helped us slay the Zotalancas and— Without a word, Olmec balled his free hand into a huge fist and stretched the wounded warrior senseless at his feet. Stooping, and hindered not at all by the struggles and imprecations of his captive, he drew Tecotl's sword from its sheath and stabbed the warrior in the breast. Then, casting aside the weapon, he fled on along the corridor. He did not see a woman's dark face peer cautiously after him from behind a hanging. It vanished, and presently Tecotl groaned and stirred, rose dazedly and staggered drunkenly away, calling Conan's name. Olmec hurried on down the corridor and descended a winding ivory staircase. He crossed several corridors and halted at last in a broad chamber, whose doors were veiled with heavy tapestries, with one exception, a heavy bronze door similar to the door of the eagle on the upper floor. He was moved to rumble, pointing to it. That is one of the outer doors of Tecultli. For the first time in fifty years it is unguarded. We need not guard it now, for Zotalank is no more. Thanks to Conan and me, you bloody rogue, sneered Valeria, trembling with fury and the shame of physical coercion. You treacherous dog! Conan will cut your throat for this! Olmec did not bother to voice his belief that Conan's own gullet had already been severed according to his whispered command. He was too utterly cynical to be at all interested in her thoughts or opinions. His flame-lit eyes devoured her, dwelling burningly on the generous expanses of clear white flesh exposed where her shirt and breeches had been torn in the struggle. Forget Conan, he said thickly. Olmec is lord of Suchotl. Zotalank is no more. There will be no more fighting. We shall spend our lives in drinking and lovemaking. First, let us drink. He seated himself on an ivory table and pulled her down on his knees, like a dark-skinned satyr with a white nymph in his arms. Ignoring her un-nymph-like profanity, he held her helpless with one great arm about her waist, while the other reached across the table and secured a vessel of wine. Drink, he commanded, forcing it to her lips, as she writhed her head away. The liquor slopped over, stinging her lips, splashing down on her naked breasts. Your guest does not like your wine, Olmec, spoke a cool, sardonic voice. Olmec stiffened. Fear grew in his flaming eyes. Slowly he swung his great head about and stared at Tassila, who posed negligently in the curtained doorway, one hand on her smooth hip. Valeria twisted herself about in his iron grip, and when she met the burning eyes of Tassila, a chill tingled along her supple spine. New experiences were flooding Valeria's proud soul that night. Recently she had learned to fear a man. Now she knew what it was to fear a woman. Olmec sat motionless a gray pallor growing under his swarthy skin. Tassila brought her other hand from behind her and displayed a small gold vessel. I feared she would not like your wine, Olmec, purred the princess, so I brought some of mine, some I brought with me long ago from the shores of Lake Zuad. Do you understand, Olmec? Beads of sweat stood out suddenly on Olmec's brow. His muscles relaxed, and Valeria broke away and put the table between them but though reason told her to dart from the room, some fascination she could not understand held her rigid, watching the scene. Tassila came toward the seated prince with a swaying, undulating walk that was mockery in itself. Her voice was soft, slurringly caressing, but her eyes gleamed. Her slim fingers stroked his beard lightly. You are selfish, Olmec, she crooned, smiling. 
You would keep our handsome guest to yourself, though you knew I wished to entertain her. You are much at fault, Olmec. The mask dropped for an instant. Her eyes flashed, her face was contorted, and with an appalling show of strength, her hand locked convulsively in his beard and tore out a great handful. This evidence of unnatural strength was no more terrifying than the momentary bearing of the hellish fury that raged under her bland exterior. Olmec lurched up with a roar and stood swaying like a bear, his mighty hands clenching and unclenching. Slut! His booming voice filled the room. Witch! She-devil! Tecultli should have slain you fifty years ago. Be gone! I have endured too much from you. This white-skinned wench is mine. Get hence before I slay you. The princess laughed and dashed the blood-stained strands into his face. Her laughter was less merciful than the ring of flint on steel. Once you spoke otherwise, Olmec, she taunted. Once in your youth you spoke words of love. I, you were my lover once years ago, and because you loved me, you slept in my arms beneath the enchanted lotus, and thereby put into my hands the chains that enslaved you. You know you cannot withstand me. You know I have but to gaze into your eyes, with the mystic power a priest of Stygia taught me long ago, and you are powerless. You remember the night beneath the black lotus that waved above us, stirred by no worldly breeze. You sent again the unearthly perfumes that stole and rose like a cloud about you to enslave you. You cannot fight against me. You are my slave as you were that night, as you shall be so long as you shall live, Olmec of Suchotl. Her voice had sunk to a murmur like the rippling of a stream running through starlit darkness. She leaned close to the prince and spread her long, tapering fingers upon his giant breast. His eyes glazed. His great hands fell limply to his sides. With a smile of cruel malice, Tassila lifted the vessel and placed it to his lips. Drink! Mechanically the prince obeyed, and instantly the glaze passed from his eyes, and they were flooded with fury, comprehension, and an awful fear. His mouth gaped, but no sound issued. For an instant he reeled on buckling knees, and then fell in a sodden heap on the floor. His fall jolted Valeria out of her paralysis. She turned and sprang toward the door but with a movement that would have shamed a leaping panther, Tassila was before her. Valeria struck at her with her clenched fist, and all the power of her supple body behind the blow. It would have stretched a man senseless on the floor, but with a lithe twist of her torso, Tassila avoided the blow and caught the pirate's wrist. The next instant Valeria's left hand was imprisoned, and holding her wrists together with one hand, Tassila calmly bound them with a cord she drew from her girdle. Valeria thought she had tasted the ultimate in humiliation already that night, but her shame at being manhandled by Olmec was nothing to the sensations that now shook her supple frame. Valeria had always been inclined to despise the other members of her sex, and it was overwhelming to encounter another woman who could handle her like a child. She scarcely resisted at all when Tassila forced her into a chair and, drawing her bound wrists down between her knees, fastened them to the chair. Casually stepping over Olmec, Tassila walked to the bronze door and shot the bolt and threw it open, revealing a hallway without. Opening upon this hall, she remarked, speaking to her feminine captive for the first time, there is a chamber which in old times was used as a torture room. When we retired into Tecultli, we brought most of the apparatus with us, but there was one piece too heavy to move. It is still in working order. I think it will be quite convenient now. An understanding flame of terror rose in Olmec's eyes. Tassila strode back to him, bent and gripped him by the hair. He is only paralyzed temporarily, she remarked conversationally. He can hear, think, and feel. Aye, he can feel very well indeed. With which sinister observation she started toward the door, dragging the giant bulk with an ease that made the pirate's eyes dilate. She passed into the hall and moved down it without hesitation presently disappearing with her captive into a chamber that opened into it, and whence shortly thereafter issued the clank of iron. Valeria swore softly and tugged vainly, with her legs braced against the chair. The cords that confined her were apparently unbreakable. Tassila presently returned alone. Behind her a muffled groaning issued from the chamber. She closed the door, but did not bolt it. 
Tassila was beyond the grip of habit, as she was beyond the touch of other human instincts and emotions. Valeria sat dumbly, watching the woman in whose slim hands, the pirate realized, her destiny now rested. Tassila grasped her yellow locks and forced back her head, looking impersonally down into her face, but the glitter in her dark eyes was not impersonal. I have chosen you for a great honor, she said. You shall restore the youth of Tassila. Oh, you stare at that. My appearance is that of youth, but through my veins creeps the sluggish chill of approaching age, as I have felt it a thousand times before. I am old, so old I do not remember my childhood. But I was a girl once, and a priest of Stygia loved me, and gave me the secret of immortality and youth everlasting. He died then some said by poison, but I dwelt in my palace by the shores of Lake Zuad, and the passing years touched me not. So at last a king of Stygia desired me, and my people rebelled and brought me to this land. Olmec called me a princess. I am not of royal blood. I am greater than a princess. I am Tassila, whose youth your own glorious youth shall restore. Valeria's tongue clove to the roof of her mouth. She sensed here a mystery darker than the degeneracy she had anticipated. The taller woman unbound the Aquilonian's wrists and pulled her to her feet. It was not fear of the dominant strength that lurked in the princess's limbs that made Valeria a helpless, quivering captive in her hands. It was the burning, hypnotic, terrible eyes of Tassila. Seven. He comes from the dark. Well, I'm a Kushite. Conan glared down at the man on the iron rack. What the devil are you doing on that thing? Incoherent sounds issued from behind the gag, and Conan bent and tore it away, evoking a bellow of fear from the captive, for his action caused the iron ball to lurch down until it nearly touched the broad breast. Be careful for Set's sake, begged Olmec. What for? demanded Conan. Do you think I care what happens to you? I only wish I had time to stay here and watch that chunk of iron grind your guts out. But I'm in a hurry. Where's Valeria? Loose me, urged Olmec. I will tell you all. Tell me first. Never. The prince's heavy jaws set stubbornly. All right. Conan seated himself on a nearby bench. I'll find her myself, after you've been reduced to a jelly. I believe I can speed up that process by twisting my sword point around in your ear, he added, extending the weapon experimentally. Wait. Words came in a rush from the captive's ashy lips. Tassila took her from me. I've never been anything but a puppet in Tassila's hands. Tassila, snorted Conan and spat. Why the filthy— No, no, panted Olmec. It's worse than you think. Tassila is old, centuries old. She renews her life and her youth by the sacrifice of beautiful young women. That's one thing that has reduced the clan to its present state. She will draw the essence of Valeria's life into her own body and bloom with fresh vigor and beauty. Are the doors locked? asked Conan, thumbing his sword edge. Aye, but I know a way to get into Takultli. Only Tassila and I know, and she thinks me helpless and you slain. Free me and I swear I will help you rescue Valeria. Without my help you cannot win into Takultli, for even if you tortured me into revealing the secret, you couldn't work it. Let me go, and we will steal on Tassila and kill her before she can work magic, before she can fix her eyes on us. A knife thrown from behind will do the work. I should have killed her thus long ago, but I feared that without her to aid us, the Zotalankas would overcome us. She needed my help too, that's the only reason she let me live this long. Now neither needs the other, and one must die. I swear that when we have slain the witch, you and Valeria shall go free without harm. My people will obey me when Tassila is dead. Conan stooped and cut the ropes that held the prince, and Olmec slid cautiously from under the great ball and rose, shaking his head like a bull, and muttering imprecations as he fingered his lacerated scalp. Standing shoulder to shoulder the two men presented a formidable picture of primitive power. Olmec was as tall as Conan, and heavier, but there was something repellent about the Tlazitlan, something abysmal and monstrous that contrasted unfavorably with the clean-cut compact hardness of the Sumerian. Conan had discarded the remnants of his tattered, blood-soaked shirt and stood with his remarkable muscular development impressively revealed. His great shoulders were as broad as those of Olmec and more cleanly outlined, 
and his huge breast arched with a more impressive sweep to a hard waist that lacked the paunchy thickness of Olmec's midsection. He might have been an image of primal strength cut out of bronze. Olmec was darker, but not from the burning of the sun. If Conan was a figure out of the dawn of time, Olmec was a shambling, somber shape from the darkness of time's pre-dawn. Lead on, demanded Conan, and keep ahead of me. I don't trust you any farther than I can throw a bull by the tail. Olmec turned and stalked on ahead of him, one hand twitching slightly as it plucked at his matted beard. Olmec did not lead Conan back to the bronze door, which the prince naturally supposed Tassila had locked, but to a certain chamber on the border of Tecultli. This secret has been guarded for half a century, he said. Not even our own clan knew of it, and the Zotalankas never learned. Tecultli himself built this secret entrance, afterwards slaying the slaves who did the work, for he feared that he might find himself locked out of his own kingdom some day, because of the spite of Tassila, whose passion for him soon changed to hate. But she discovered the secret, and barred the hidden door against him one day, as he fled back from an unsuccessful raid, and the Zotalankas took him and flayed him. But once, spying upon her, I saw her enter Tecultli by this route and so learned the secret. He pressed upon a gold ornament in the wall, and a panel swung inward, disclosing an ivory stair leading upward. This stair is built within the wall, said Olmec. It leads up to a tower upon the roof, and thence other stairs wind down to the various chambers. Hasten. After you, comrade, retorted Conan satirically, swaying his broadsword as he spoke, and Olmec shrugged his shoulders and stepped onto the staircase. Conan instantly followed him, and the door shut behind them. Far above a cluster of fire jewels made the staircase a well of dusky dragonlight. They mounted until Conan estimated that they were above the level of the fourth floor, and then came out into a cylindrical tower, in the domed roof of which was set the bunch of fire jewels that lighted the stair. Through gold-barred windows, set with unbreakable crystal panes, the first windows he had seen in Suchotl, Conan got a glimpse of high ridges, domes, and more towers, looming darkly against the stars. He was looking across the roofs of Xuchotl. Olmec did not look through the windows. He hurried down one of the several stairs that wound down from the tower, and when they had descended a few feet, this stair changed into a narrow corridor that wound tortuously on for some distance. It ceased at a steep flight of steps leading downward. There Olmec paused. Up from below, muffled but unmistakable, welled a woman's scream, edged with fright, fury, and shame, and Conan recognized Valeria's voice. In the swift rage roused by that cry, and the amazement of wondering what peril could wring such a shriek from Valeria's reckless lips, Conan forgot Olmec. He pushed past the prince and started down the stair. Awakening instinct brought him about again, just as Olmec struck with his great mallet-like fist. The blow fierce and silent, was aimed at the base of Conan's brain. But the Sumerian wheeled in time to receive the buffet on the side of his neck instead. The impact would have snapped the vertebrae of a lesser man. As it was, Conan swayed backward. But even as he reeled, he dropped his sword, useless at such close quarters, and grasped Olmec's extended arm, dragging the prince with him as he fell. Headlong they went down the steps together, in a revolving whirl of limbs and heads and bodies. And as they went, Conan's iron fingers found and locked in Olmec's bull throat. The barbarian's neck and shoulder felt numb from the sledge-like impact of Olmec's huge fist, which had carried all the strength of the massive forearm, thick triceps and great shoulder. But this did not affect his ferocity to any appreciable extent. Like a bulldog he hung on grimly shaken and battered and beaten against the steps as they rolled, until at last they struck an ivory panel door at the bottom, with such an impact that they splintered it down its full length and crashed through its ruins. But Olmec was already dead, for those iron fingers had crushed out his life and broken his neck as they fell. Conan rose, shaking the splinters from his great shoulder, blinking blood and dust out of his eyes. He was in the great throne room, there were fifteen people in that room besides himself. The first person he saw was Valeria. A curious black altar stood before the throne dais. Ranged about it, seven black candles in golden candlesticks, 
sent up oozing spirals of thick green smoke, disturbingly scented. These spirals united in a cloud near the ceiling, forming a smoky arch above the altar. On that altar lay Valeria, stark naked, her white flesh gleaming in shocking contrast to the glistening ebon stone. She was not bound. She lay at full length, her arms stretched out above her head to their fullest extent. At the head of the altar knelt a young man, holding her wrists firmly. A young woman knelt at the other end of the altar, grasping her ankles. Between them she could neither rise nor move. Eleven men and women of Tecoltli knelt dumbly in a semicircle, watching the scene with hot, lustful eyes. On the ivory throne seat, Tassila lolled. Bronze bowls of incense rolled their spirals about her. The wisps of smoke curled about her naked limbs like caressing fingers. She could not sit still. She squirmed and shifted about with sensuous abandon, as if finding pleasure in the contact of the smooth ivory with her sleek flesh. The crash of the door as it broke beneath the impact of the hurtling bodies caused no change in the scene. The kneeling men and women merely glanced incuriously at the corpse of their prince and at the man who rose from the ruins of the door, then swung their eyes greedily back to the writhing white shape on the black altar. Tassila looked insolently at him and sprawled back on her seat, laughing mockingly. Slut! Conan saw red. His hands clenched into iron hammers as he started for her. With his first step something clanged loudly, and steel bit savagely into his leg. He stumbled and almost fell, checked in his headlong stride. The jaws of an iron trap had closed on his leg, with teeth that sank deep and held. Only the ridged muscles of his calf saved the bone from being splintered. The accursed thing had sprung out of the smoldering floor without warning. He saw the slots now, in the floor where the jaws had lain, perfectly camouflaged. Fool, laughed Tassila. Did you think I would not guard against your possible return? Every door in this chamber is guarded by such traps. Stand there and watch now, while I fulfill the destiny of your handsome friend. Then I will decide your own. Conan's hand instinctively sought his belt only to encounter an empty scabbard. His sword was on the stair behind him. His poniard was lying back in the forest, where the dragon had torn it from his jaw. The steel teeth in his leg were like burning coals, but the pain was not as savage as the fury that seethed in his soul. He was trapped, like a wolf. If he had had his sword, he would have hewn off his leg and crawled across the floor to slay Tassila. Valeria's eyes rolled toward him with mute appeal and his own helplessness sent red waves of madness surging through his brain. Dropping on the knee of his free leg, he strove to get his fingers between the jaws of the trap, to tear them apart by sheer strength. Blood started from beneath his fingernails, but the jaws fitted close about his leg in a circle, whose segments jointed perfectly, contracted until there was no space between his mangled flesh and the fanged iron. The sight of Valeria's naked body added flame to the fire of his rage. Tassila ignored him. Rising languidly from her seat, she swept the ranks of her subjects with a searching glance and asked, Where are Zamek, Slanath, and Tachik? They did not return from the catacombs, princess, answered a man. Like the rest of us, they bore the bodies of the slain into the crypts, but they have not returned. Perhaps the ghost of Tolkamek took them. Be silent, fool she ordered harshly. The ghost is a myth. She came down from her dais, playing with a thin gold-hilted dagger. Her eyes burned like nothing on the hither side of hell. She paused beside the altar and spoke in the tense stillness. Your life shall make me young, white woman, she said. I shall lean upon your bosom and place my lips over yours, and slowly, ah, slowly, sink this blade through your heart, so that your life, fleeing your stiffening body, shall enter mine, making me bloom again with youth and with life everlasting. Slowly, like a serpent arching toward its victim, she bent down through the writhing smoke, closer and closer over the now motionless woman who stared up into her glowing dark eyes, eyes that grew larger and deeper, blazing like black moons in the swirling smoke. The kneeling people gripped their hands and held their breath, tense for the bloody climax and the only sound was Conan's fierce panting as he strove to tear his leg from the trap. All eyes were glued on the altar and the white figure there. 
The crash of a thunderbolt could hardly have broken the spell, yet it was only a low cry that shattered the fixity of the scene and brought all whirling about, a low cry, yet one to make the hair stand up stiffly on the scalp. They looked and they saw. Framed in the door to the left of the dais stood a nightmare figure. It was a man, with a tangle of white hair and a matted white beard that fell over his breast. Rags only partly covered his gaunt frame, revealing half-naked limbs strangely unnatural in appearance. The skin was not like that of a normal human. There was a suggestion of scaliness about it, as if the owner had dwelt long under conditions almost antithetical to those conditions under which human life ordinarily thrives. And there was nothing at all human about the eyes that blazed from the tangle of white hair. They were great gleaming discs that stared unwinkingly, luminous, whitish, and without a hint of normal emotion or sanity. The mouth gaped, but no coherent words issued, only a high-pitched tittering. Tolkamek, whispered Tassila, livid, while the others crouched in speechless horror. No myth, then, no ghost. Set, you have dwelt for twelve years in darkness, twelve years among the bones of the dead. What grisly food did you find? What mad travesty of life did you live? in the stark blackness of that eternal night. I see now why Zamek and Zlanath and Tachik did not return from the catacombs, and never will return. But why have you waited so long to strike? Were you seeking something, in the pits, some secret weapon you knew was hidden there, and have you found it at last? That hideous tittering was Tolkemec's only reply, as he bounded into the room with a long leap that carried him over the secret trap before the door. By chance, or by some faint recollection of the ways of Suchotl. He was not mad, as a man is mad. He had dwelt apart from humanity so long that he was no longer human, only an unbroken thread of memory embodied in hate, and the urge for vengeance had connected him with the humanity from which he had been cut off, and held him lurking near the people he hated. Only that thin string had kept him from racing and prancing off forever into the black corridors and realms of the subterranean world he had discovered long ago. You sought something hidden, whispered Tassila, cringing back. And you have found it. You remember the feud. After all these years of blackness you remember. For in the lean hand of Tolkemec now waved a curious jade-hued wand, on the end of which glowed a knob of crimson shaped like a pomegranate. She sprang aside as he thrust it out like a spear and a beam of crimson fire lanced from the pomegranate. It missed Tassila, but the woman holding Valeria's ankles was in the way. It smote between her shoulders. There was a sharp crackling sound, and the ray of fire flashed from her bosom and struck the black altar with a snapping of blue sparks. The woman toppled sidewise, shriveling and withering like a mummy, even as she fell. Valeria rolled from the altar on the other side, and started for the opposite wall on all fours, for hell had burst loose in the throne room of dead Olmec. The man who had held Valeria's hands was the next to die. He turned to run, but before he had taken half a dozen steps, Tolkemec, with an agility appalling in such a frame, bounded around to a position that placed the man between him and the altar. Again the red fire beam flashed, and the Tecultli rolled lifeless to the floor as the beam completed its course with a burst of blue sparks against the altar, then began slaughter. Screaming insanely, the people rushed about the chamber, caroming from one another, stumbling and falling, and among them, Tolkemec capered and pranced, dealing death. They could not escape by the doors, for apparently the metal of the portal served like the metal, vain stone altar to complete the circuit for whatever hellish power flashed like thunderbolts from the witch wand the ancient waved in his hand. When he caught a man or a woman between him and a door or the altar, that one died instantly. He chose no special victim. He took them as they came, with his rags flapping about his wildly gyrating limbs, and the gusty echoes of his tittering sweeping the room above the screams, and bodies fell like falling leaves about the altar and at the doors. One warrior in desperation rushed at him, lifting a dagger, only to fall before he could strike, but the rest were like crazed cattle, with no thought for resistance and no chance of escape. The last Tecultli, except Tassila, had fallen when the princess reached the Cimmerian and the girl who had taken refuge beside him.
Tassila bent and touched the floor, pressing a design upon it. Instantly the iron jaws released the bleeding limb and sank back into the floor. Slay him if you can, she panted, and pressed a heavy knife into his hand. I have no magic to withstand him. With a grunt he sprang before the women, not heeding his lacerated leg in the heat of the fighting lust. Tolkemec was coming toward him, his weird eyes ablaze, but he hesitated at the gleam of the knife in Conan's hand. Then began a grim game, as Tolkemec sought to circle about Conan and get the barbarian between him and the altar, or a metal door, while Conan sought to avoid this and drive home his knife. The women watched tensely, holding their breath. There was no sound except the rustle and scrape of quick-shifting feet. Tolkemec pranced and capered no more. He realized that grimmer game confronted him than the people who had died screaming and fleeing. In the elemental blaze of the barbarian's eyes, he read an intent deadly as his own. Back and forth they weaved, and when one moved the other moved as if invisible threads bound them together. But all the time Conan was getting closer and closer to his enemy. Already the coiled muscles of his thighs were beginning to flex for a spring, when Valeria cried out. For a fleeting instant, a bronze door was in line with Conan's moving body. The red line leaped, searing Conan's flank as he twisted aside, and even as he shifted he hurled the knife. Old Tolkemec went down, truly slain at last, the hilt vibrating on his breast. Tassila sprang, not toward Conan, but toward the wand where it shimmered like a live thing on the floor. But as she leaped, so did Valeria, with a dagger snatched from a dead man, and the blade, driven with all the power of the pirate's muscles, impaled the princess of Tecultli, so that the point stood out between her breasts. Tassila screamed once and fell dead, and Valeria spurned the body with her heel as it fell. I had to do that much for my own self-respect, panted Valeria, facing Conan across the limp corpse. Well, this cleans up the feud, he grunted. It's been a hell of a night. Where did these people keep their food? I'm hungry. You need a bandage on that leg. Valeria ripped a length of silk from a hanging and knotted it about her waist, then tore off some smaller strips which she bound efficiently about the barbarian's lacerated limb. I can walk on it, he assured her. Let's be gone. It's dawn, outside this infernal city. I've had enough of Zuchotl. It's well the breed exterminated itself. I don't want any of their accursed jewels. They might be haunted. There is enough clean loot in the world for you and me, she said, straightening to stand tall and splendid before him. The old blaze came back in his eyes, and this time she did not resist, as he caught her fiercely in his arms. It's a long way to the coast, she said presently, withdrawing her lips from his. What matter? he laughed. There's nothing we can't conquer. We'll have our feet on a ship's deck before the Stygians open their ports for the trading season and then we'll show the world what plundering means.